Welcome, friend, to another devlog entry in the ongoing saga of making the creative 5 versus 5 game, Lodragger. Um, wow, check it out. Look at this. I got 3D camera rotation working and finally fast enough so that it can actually um, happen in real time. Um, you can see that it's not actually rotating the camera correctly when it goes from 0 to 45. It's the camera offset is completely off. My math there is wrong. But what I'm showing you here is that it actually can perform at a decent enough frame rate that you can see something happening. Um, up until about 15 minutes ago, it was so uh, it was performing so slowly that it would do one tick, like it would go down to one frame per second when it was trying to rotate the camera. So through a lot of introspection and um, data analysis and other debugging today, I've improved the performance enough that it can happen in real time. So after this, um, after today, I'll basically be working on getting um, the rotation offset of the camera to, to be correct. Um, so that'll be uh, that'll make it look a lot better once the player is in the center of the rotation every single time it rotates. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the code, some of the things I found in the system that really improved the performance. Um, I started with adding a whole bunch of debug statements to track um, the render system because I was very curious to what was going on, and I found through trying starting to track the EIDs of which, e which entities basically were on screen, I found out that um, it, there was something really weird going on. It was drawing eight like 1,800 different entities, and I was looking at the bounding boxes and realized that, whoa, some of these bounding boxes, these entities aren't even on the screen, and somehow it's rendering them. And it all turned out to be something really simple. It was like a one-liner. Here you go. All I had to do was tick the camera pause after I ticked the camera rotation. Because when you tick the camera rotation, it changes, the, of course, the angle of the camera, which changes any one of the 2D positions that you would project from a 3D position. And the camera pause has a 3D position as well as a 2D position. And both of these are critical numbers to the way this whole system works. So by rotating the camera first, you've got the correct angle so that when you actually project the 3D camera pause onto the 2D camera pause, it is accurate. So that actually, that that one change right there, this one liner change, which took hours to figure out, was um, so, so much improved the performance of the system because it actually was drawing the correct entities on screen. Another huge performance boost came from hollowing out this, this bush. So you can see this bush has like, um, you know, this many voxels. It's it's only 16 by 16 by 28. But with all of those voxels inside here, inside this whole thing, that was like 4,000 voxels. So every time it would have to, every time the camera rotates, it has to repaint every single on-screen entity because the camera rotation has changed. Everything, every single bit of every one of the voxels has to be repainted. So, um, by simplifying these uh, models and making them hollow, where you can't those you wouldn't be able to see those voxels ever anyway, so why not just get rid of them? Um, that improved the performance quite considerably as well. And uh, what I'll be doing to um, to make this work for every single one of the models I create in the future for this game is I'm going to make it a little um, interpreter that can interpret. This is the saved in the vox format because this is magic of voxel here. They publish their Vox format online, and it's pretty simple. Um, so you basically just, I'll, what I'll do is I'll write a converter, basically, that reads in a Vox file, it determines any one of the voxels that are just completely occluded and will never be visible, and then deletes them from that, that model, and then saves that, that, um, that, that uh, leaner and meaner version of the voxel file in, um, in the game's uh, assets folder. So in my actual game editing folder over here, I'll be able to edit them and I won't I won't have to worry about ever going and hollowing things out and um, it, it'll just be an automatic utility app basically that filters them before it ever loads them in the game. So that'll be really efficient at runtime because there's nothing else to do. It's just a 
simpler model. Another thing I could do to help um, with this, which I've already written some code for, but it appears that is not functioning correctly at the current moment, is that um, you can uh, actually occlude models, depending on your camera rotation, you could actually just project all your pixels and figure out which pixels at their current depths are behind other pixels, uh, which are, you know, the voxels projected become pixels. So um, that's another thing too. I got to turn on that switch for the occluding objects and figure out what's wrong with it and uh, basically get that up to speed. And then it would, then I, um, it'll dynamically occlude vo all, the, all the voxels that are behind. Right now, if I twist this entity around, you can see there's always some voxels which are in the which are behind that we can't ever see, no matter what camera angle we're at. Um, there's always something you can't see, so why not occlude those? And uh, I think that will also be another huge performance boost. Um, what else was there? Uh, let me take a look at more of my. Um, oh, I made the depth buffer a little bit smaller. That uh, makes it faster. Oh, I made the grids the grid system able to conditionally track all of its EIDs because the cons the collision system uses 3D a uh, 3D grid, well a 2D grid but from 3D positions, and um, that has to track all all of its all of its EIDs so that it makes the collision system a lot faster um, because some collision EIDs might be in the underworld versus the overworld so they're not current and you don't need to tick them when they're not current, um, so that sped up the grid editing quite significantly because the render system does not need to track all of its EIDs. The render system uses its own special algorithm which is it, it calculates all the on-screen EIDs not just all the EIDs in general. So by not using because it's all EIDs and all EIDs map the way this works with the grid is it has to use a map to handle that because um, it's always editing EIDs at certain points of the grid and it has to check the map to see whether that EID is going to be um, is already one of the all EIDs, basically. So by not using a map, that's way, way faster um, for the render system in particular. Uh, oh, and another thing that was pretty interesting, this is kind of cool, I'll show this, um, I'll show this in here in the code this way. Uh, I've got this thing called expressions.h. I found this from, um, let me t show you the link where I found this. Uh, R D E S T L. It's github.com M S I N I L O R D E S T L. So they've got they've got some pretty cool stuff. Basically, it's what what the point of this um is to create a very simple S T L uh, library that that basically mimics the S T L, but is so nice and small and compact and uh, just efficient and all that. So I basically borrowed some of that for Kit Fu, and then um, sort of I've actually reworked it a lot as I've created my own vector class, my own map class, my own pair, things like that. But one of the things I found from that was all these different, um, all these different ways to inspect types. Check this out. You can say is integral. Um, you can declare a template uh, function called is integral that. Uh, on, starts at value false and then for all the integral types you can just find a special version of that function where it sets those values to true so and then you've also got another one here for for is floating point and another one for is pointer and then you've got combining all that you can do is fundamental so you can declare a struct that has a value that says is integral or is a floating point and then you can determine if uh, a something has a trivial constructor. So a trivial constructor means that, um, <coughs> excuse me, it just doesn't have a constructor. Basically, it's like an integer, for example, it doesn't have a constructor, it just starts at whatever value it is unless you assign it a value when it starts. Um, so in let, let's look at the problem. What I'm trying to describe here is the problem was that what I used to have explicit pair and it looked like that. So when I would create a pair, with only the key and not the value, or only the first element, not the second element, I see this, there's nothing initializing the second value to anything. So if that second value is an integer, and it doesn't have a constructor, it's just gonna be random data. So what I did is I used expressions construct, 
to construct that second element with the default constructor. And let's look at that expressions construct because it uses that has trivial um, constructor to um, to do its its construction. So let's look at what that is. Here's here we're gonna here's part of it. We're gonna be looking at this first part down here though. The there it is. Regular construct. Okay. You just give it a, uh, an address, and it, it calls internal construct on the memory, right on that address you gave it. And then here's the magic. It calls internal int to type to basically just turn this into a type. And uh, that value we're looking at is if if that, if that t, which is in our case, we're talking about t being an integer, if that has a trivial destructor, then it gets passed, then a special version of internal construct will be called. And let's look at those two functions. So one of them would be if we do have a trivial constructor, and one of them will be if we don't have a trivial constructor. And that's what this means right here. This is into type false, which is basically, you could, this is just basically into type false unused, right? We're not using the name of that variable. So this is how it's kind of confusing to me when I was first looking at this code. Um, but that's basically what's going on there. And so if it is a non-trivial constructor, like for example, a class that you've written or a structure, it's gonna call new in place or what is that called in place? I forget, but basically this is the new, this bit, well, all this is basically doing is calling the constructor for T on that memory address without a lot allocating any of that memory, right? You've given it the memory already. It just calls the constructor basically. That's all this is. Um, and a little bit more, I'm sure there's something else going on behind besides just calling the constructor. But uh, if it is a trivial type, then we're gonna be, then it's gonna call this version of construct because We've got an int type true as um, the value there, so it's kind of some C plus plus wizardry magic that I didn't I didn't actually write any of this. I just basically like I said I found it from R E S T L. Um, so they're the smart guys that thought of all this. Uh, but I'm proud enough. I'm proud that I actually understood it enough tonight that I could figure out how to initialize um, integers to zero. And why is that necessary? Why the heck does that even help anything? Well, the problem was that in map.h when I would insert, um, basically when you're calling operator uh, brackets on a map, um, and the second value was an integer, it wasn't it wasn't initializing it to anything. So because it was calling tree find node, it wasn't finding anything. So it calls tree insert. Let's look at tree insert. Um, tree insert, here we go. Basically, uh, tree insert basically goes and eventually creates a pair. Where the heck is that? Is it make pair? There it is. Okay, this is it. If null, then tree insert pair key val key. Like I was just describing a little bit earlier there in pair.h, that I'm, I'm calling this version of the constructor here where it's where you're not passing in a second value. So now that's smart enough to initialize an integer to zero. Um, so that is kind of a complicated way for me to speed up the grids a little bit more too. Because when we're editing the grid, we have to remember or forget certain eids. And calling that right there is simpler than uh, the old version of this code, which used to look like used to look like all this stuff in red. It would have to first find inside the map and then possibly insert in the map as well. So now we can just basically get the value right away and use it. So that's the benefit of having integers constructed to zero there. So I guess that's all. No, that's all for this video, man. There's like I just covered a lot of stuff there. It was a, kind of a really fruitful day, actually, as far as code went. So I'm looking forward to getting to the point in this game where I can focus more on the art. That's going to be pretty exciting. All the this engine work is finally getting to be somewhat solid. You know, this it's going to be a month or two left before this voxel engine is really looking good and 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 smooth, running smooth at 60 frames a second all the time. But uh, I'm excited because it's uh it's already getting there. So thanks again for watching this video. Hope you learned something. Hope this was of value to you. Cheers and see you next time.